Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. We are um, really excited about presenting this beautiful exhibition of new work by Dante Marioni. Um, sorry about the background noise, street noise. Uh, but we're here in the gallery, as you can see, and we're going to walk through the exhibition with Bill and Dante. Uh, we're going to do this a little bit. I've typically been leading these um, walkthroughs, but I think because Bill and Dante go back so many years, that it'd be fun to have the two of them kind of lead the conversation. Um, and then I'll jump in with any questions. Um, do you want to take it over? Sure. So we started the gallery in 1977 in Belltown, which was a old area in Seattle before we moved here. We've been in this location now 25 years. But back in 1977, we had this little space in Belltown. And one of the shows that we had that was an outstanding show was uh, when Dante was 23, he had a one-man show at our gallery. Sorry about the sirens. We're in the big city. <laughs> uh, he had this, uh, a one-man show in our gallery, and it was a complete sellout. And this was a show of his uh, infamous Whoppers. They were called the Whoppers. <laughs> And Dante, I asked Dante, well, why did you name it Whopper? Why did you name those vessels Whoppers? You know, it happened, uh, it, I was in the studio, you came to visit and asked me what they were. And I, I'm, I'm still not very good at coming up with titles. And my friend, uh, uh, Benjamin Moore, one time referenced these giant Whopper vases, he said, that were mold blown he saw in Italy. And it was sort of an amphora shape. So that kind of popped into my head without giving it very much thought. And um, so that's how the name Whopper came. Yeah, it did. Huh. And I, I, I really regretted it because just I didn't know that people would like them that much. And they did like them. They turned into a thing. And yeah. I remember that we were selling so many of these Whoppers variations on a theme. These Whoppers were all different primary colors. And they were really, really, really popular. And at one point, Dante said, no more Whoppers. Good. No more. And then we kept getting inquiries, people wanting to have a whopper and no more whoppers Done. yeah then there was a whole period of time when dante was famous for his goblets there were all these goblets that you were making and yeah for every, every year you did a series of goblets i did i did make goblets just as uh just kind of for fun really it wasn't necessarily part of my professional practice though i i have made some uh like sculptural objects that made out of goblets and some functional things like a chandelier, a couple of chandeliers that was all comprised of wine glasses, but it was more just a way to learn how to blow glass. Right. And, um, and those were also very popular. Everybody wanted yeah. one, of your, one of your yeah. goblets. Yeah. And I think that's still to this day, people are, because you're so skillful, your, your skill level is so good as a result of making stuff these, like that. Yeah, yeah, making precise things like that is why I can do uh, the things that I'm interested in doing, which is making my own artwork. Right. Because <laughs> making wine glasses isn't really that spiritually fulfilling to me. Uh, it's just practice. And as it happens, I haven't been able to do it the last few years. So I haven't really kept up with it. Oh, really? Uh, so then uh, the whoppers were going, the goblets were going, and then a, a variation of series of different series. There was the the series of vessels that uh, ended up in the White House collection, the Smithsonian White House collection. Yeah. Yes. And you were on the cover of the, the catalog that came out? Yeah, in the magazine, the Smithsonian magazine. Yeah, it was a big month. Right. That month, yeah. It was yeah. Like in 1995. And uh, when people visit my studio, I tell the story about that because at the time when the White House collection was put together, I felt like I had done enough with that series. I have a short span of attention. I've made, I, I, I have a very diverse product line for an <laughs> artist. I've made a lot of different things because I just, it, it gets old, like making Whopper vases or the Goose Beak pitcher or whatever it is. You make them and then you move on. And uh, I was ready to move on when that happened. I got all that wonderful publicity and then I decided to keep making them. And um, I continued making work like that, which, uh, uh, is so different than what I do now because I've never made anything that uh, was so obvious as the works that I'm doing now in terms of it being about pattern and light and glass. Like the, the early work I did, it had to be made out of glass, but it could have been made out of something else. Right. You know, and that it was, all, I used opaque colors and I was just interested in form as a glass blower. Right. You know, and somehow along the way, 
that that changed and I started to really embrace the patterns, mm -hmm. which is what this work is all about. But before we move on to the pattern pieces, I just want to mention that looking at your resume here, it's uh, I was looking at the selected uh, a selected selection of museum collections. And the list goes on and on and on and on. And, and I think there's, I counted here, I think I counted 43 different museums that you have your works in. Probably, yeah. But none of these pieces. Not yet. Not yet. No, none just, of these new. brand new. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, anyway, uh, it's been a long, long journey. We, we uh, eventually moved to this location. And, and I have to say that a uh, big reason we're able to be in this location and have so much success has been our relationship with Dante. Over the years, we've had many, many different shows and Dante's always been very, very successful with his shows and our rent is paid by Dante. <laughs> this, okay. this, uh, a big part of our success here is- uh, That's good to know. Is yeah. Dante Marioni, so. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. So anyway, that's- Which has a lot to do with Dante making really exceptional work, I would <laughs> well, add. Whatever. Right, I think I think it's a joint thing, you yeah, know. Yeah. We, we work together, and we've worked together this, for a long time. This gallery is is uh, I'm sure you guys know, but it's a destination. It's like people people around the world know about the, the Traver Gallery, and it, for for the glass in particular, right? You know, the Studio Glass movement being focused kind of here in the Northwest. This is the hot spot. Right, people travel yeah. from all over the world and and via the internet. And then different ways to find us and seek us out for the glass that yeah. is produced here in the Northwest, particularly. And a lot of that has uh, to do with people like Chihuly and Lino Taglia Pietro, who Dante has had a fabulous relationship with over the years. As a matter of fact, his son is named after Lino, I believe. That's yeah. right. <laughs> yeah. So we'll go with that. Yeah. So we have a, there's a long, long history of Dante's involvement with the Northwest here in the glass and, uh, also, I want to mention the Pilchuck Glass School, which mm -hmm. Dante has been my alma mater. Yeah, right. That's why. That's why I'm here. Is right. Of Pilchuck. So with all that, I think we'll move on to our current show. And so, and this is a, I think one of the a really incredible. I Dante would tell you that it's it's incredible. Yeah, <laughs> uh, uh, it's my favorite. It's my my personal favorite. This this work. Uh, I don't usually make things that are about anything. I don't think like my work hasn't ever been, uh, there hasn't been a narrative connected to it other than just my personal story of being a glass blower and the skill and the teamwork and things like that that really don't matter at the end of the day when you look at the finished object. And this work, these pieces in particular, the ones I call the print series, uh, kind of are uh, an extension of my, 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 uh, uh, interest in abstract painting. I really like the work of uh, my, well, my, my, one of my uncles, but then uh, Bryce Martin is a painter in New York City that did this series uh, he called Cold Mountain, and they're actually with, as they're actually drawings, and he was inspired by Chinese calligraphy. And uh, there's one in the San Francisco Art Museum that's a white paint piece with uh, the black uh, uh, drawings on it, and then he puts a wash over that and does another layer. And I thought. Well, you know, I can do that with glass because it's glass. And um, this is more brush strokey than his work is, or those particular pieces are, but they're, they're not, um, it, it's just, I've finally been able to embrace uh, um, non-representational -repres abstraction. Like they really are about nothing but what you see. And that's it. And it's interesting. I mean, one of the things that I find interesting about this work is that you use this sort of familiar leaf shape. Yeah. Um, but really, the it almost it's just a canvas, really, in a lot of respects. Uh, I I uh, before I was or since I've been making this work, I saw an interview in a magazine with Lino Telli Petra, and he uh, referenced this gentleman that is long gone, but I met when I was a teenager, uh, A. D. Copier. He was a, a Dutch designer. And uh, I, I met him once when he came to the Pilchuck School, sorry, Penland School, when I was a student there, I was like 19 years old. And I didn't realize what a big deal the dude was at the time. He had, I had no frame of reference for who this guy was. Lino ended up making things with him and working with him uh, over the, through the 80s, I guess, probably is when it was winding up. 
And there's a quote from that, that uh, interview that I have pinned on my refrigerator where Lino says, he, uh, Copier ta taught Lino how to um, look at the vessel differently and sort of frame it as a canvas. Hmm. I was already doing that, making the leaf pieces that I had been making and, and, and things like that. But that was a way to actually say it out loud. Yeah. That, that's what this, this is. I mean, I've made this shape and it's had a leaf pattern and it's been nothing but a leaf, you know, but now it's, it's not. And I mean, I'm not gonna stay here and say it's like a painting because that's a little <laughs> too corny, but that is what I'm after. It is like a painting, but it's also so, it so celebrates the qualities of glass. Yeah in the way that the optics work yeah. um, and it, the transparency and the way that it plays with light. Yeah, it could only be made out of glass. Yeah. And I haven't made a lot of work, or my early work could have been made out of ceramics and airbrushed or something, right. you know? But this, this work is about glass, which I've yeah. kind of resisted, to be honest. And it's more than the leaf shape itself, because if you go around the room, as we move around the gallery, and see each of these individual pieces, you'll discover different ways that the piece is interacting with you because of the overlaying glass and that more more pattern that right. occurs. So they're like paintings, except they're in movement too. Yeah, that's the part you can't do with the paint. Yeah. Right. That's the thing that, yeah, that's what that's the advantage we have working with this stuff. Should we walk um, and see some of the other pieces? Sure. I noticed that as you look, we have these trees outside of our window here and the action outside the window and with the transparency of the work and the color of the green of the trees and the piece itself, all of this is interacting. Mm -hmm. Everything is changing and moving. Yeah, they definitely look different than in my studio. <laughs> and I mean that in a good way. <laughs> they look nice in here. So Dante, can you tell us a little bit about the process? I know it's hard to do without props but yeah um <clears throat> essentially uh these things started i've i've been make i made a couple different series that were pattern driven like this uh there's an, an example around the corner we'll get to in a minute but these ones um again i wanted to do i wanted to try to figure out how to do this sort of brush strokey look you know with the the stripes the way they're they're arranged here and the way that we ended up doing it was every, uh, we made, you have to make a lot of canes, mm -hmm. which is a piece of black, then a piece of topaz in this case, and then clear glass over it. <laughs> and we, we pull them outside down the driveway unless it's raining. Then we go down the hall. Then all those canes are chopped up into equal lengths, about eight inches long and laid out into a, a, actually quite a big pickup, like almost two feet. Mm -hmm. And, um, then we pick up the, the, the cane, get them hot, then pick them up onto a big wheel that we've made. And we make a, just a, a rondelle, which is just a circular, it's a very traditional circular blown glass disc that in the olden days, they made windows and stuff. But in this case, it's just pick up all the canes, twist them as tight as I can, and then uh, make this flat circle. And I have to do about seven of them. It takes, I don't know, all, almost all day to pull the cane and make the seven things. And then I, the hard part, the hard part of being an artist really to me, isn't about the uh, glass blowing. It's about uh, coming up with something that hasn't been done before yeah. <laughs> and that people like, and that you like. I know that sounds that's so obvious, but it really is the difficult part of it. Because at this stage, I have these seven rondelles facing me, and I have this uh, ceramic plate that I'm going to chop them up and arrange them and make this composition. And I have to really cons carefully consider how I'm going to arrange the composition and what the piece is going to look like. The glass blowing, though, myself and the guys, uh, we blow glass at a super high level. It's the easy part. Yeah, you know. Of, so of at that point, you're in the studio, all all the glass is cold, and you're just I'm there working with a, on a flat I'm surface. Like a, I'm like a stained glass artist. I'm cutting up these rondelles and arranging them. Sometimes I'll draw on the uh, with a lead pencil. I'll draw on the ceramic 
rectangular ceramic plate what I'm going to do. Because mm -hmm. generally I make them that, so that they have two sides. You know, they're both the same. I want, I want you to look through it and see something that lines up with it. Hmm. Not always, but sometimes, or at least parts of them. So I have, that means I have to do a kind of a mirror image on, you know, the patterns are mm -hmm. two sides. <clears throat> and then uh, that gets picked up, heated up again once I'm done cutting it up. And that's, that part also takes the longest mm -hmm. to set up the pattern. Yeah. Takes longer than it does to blow the piece of glass. Uh, it gets rolled, picked up and made into just like a cup made out of that, that material, those chopped up rondelles, my little jigsaw puzzle, if you will. And then um, at a later date, those are put into an oven and gotten, we get them hot and then we can make one after another. That's how we make the pieces. I've, I've got the patterns already finished. And that's how I always do everything. It doesn't make sense to do all the whole step at once because we'd make one piece a day. Right. And um, I can make more than that when I have the patterns already done. So I'm, I hope that wasn't too confusing. <laughs> Dante, I remember when I walked into your studio for the first time seeing these new works and how excited I was. I couldn't believe what I was looking at. I've, in all the 50 years I've been looking at glass and showing glass and from artists from all over the world here in the gallery, I never saw anything quite like this. I was so blown away. That by is it. a high compliment because, um, as I said, you know, you try to do things like everything I've done. There's, there's a, there's, some, there's something that inspired it, you know. In the the previous series of leaves I made, there's a, a wooden leaf dish, Tapio made in 1951, and I looked at that wooden leaf dish made out of laminated birch wood, and it really looks like a leaf, only it's made out of wood. And I thought to myself, if I made that pattern in glass and made a vessel that I squeezed flat, it would create that moray effect. And mm -hmm. I was I was right. You know, mm -hmm. I worked on the first trip on the first time, and and um, you know, it, you try not to do anything that's been done before, which is just such an obvious thing to say. But so many people don't live by that. There's so many. There's so much derivative glass out there, and Lino Telepietra makes it really hard because he has been around for a long time and he's tried everything. Right. So it's, to do something he hasn't done is pretty tricky right. to make things that, you know, aren't lean only. And um, so that, thank you. Cause that, that's what I, that was what I was trying to do. Just make something that hadn't been made. Before. Let's move on to the next piece. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but if you move back back and forth just a little bit, so you can, in this piece you can really see that movement, the, the moray pattern in that heart of that piece there. So incredible. For being such uh, simple shapes, it's actually taken a long time to um, get it down. Like uh, making the foot, for example, is is a departure from how I've done stuff in the, up until the last decade. I never did anything that had a solid element like that, the, the heavy foot. And um, it's, it took a long time for us to learn how to do this stuff. And I say us, I'm talking about uh, Janusz Pozniak and Mikey Kazar are the two guys that primarily work with me. Janusz works with me every single time I go last, but Mikey comes in uh, uh, when we make large pieces. And so, <clears throat> How long have you been working with Yanush? 30 years this wow. month. Yeah. 30 years? Yeah. We should get some plaque or metal or something. Again, you know, it's like just putting together the um, the uh, the composition is really the, the, the most difficult element of doing this. I mean, it's hard to make nice ones. We make bad ones through inattentiveness or overlooking things in the glass point studio but the, to make an interesting pattern is the, the biggest challenge so let's move on to the blue one now the contrast to the red one the and the way the pattern changes yeah i did this one where we um though these lines are bigger they all started out the same size this one i just didn't twist once I made the, picked up all the canes, I didn't twist it hardly at all, or very little relative to the other parts. And I wanted to do it to have that contrast. So that's why that one's kind of different than, than most of the rest of them. 
And then in contrast to that one, this one, which is so regular, this is really different. <clears throat> this, uh, these pieces uh, I refer to as uh, uh, amaze, not amaze, but a maze. And um, they came before the prints that we're doing now, but kind of, a, kind of around the same time, really. And again, I've, I've used the same form because it's just a great, canvas for creating a get that that um, moray pattern you know when you move around it all the lines toss up and this one in particular has green on the inside of the blue That's yeah the, the color on this one is really it's incredible. different incredible it almost um that combination of the green and the blue makes it almost metallic yeah it, it's I, I wish i could remember how i did it but it's really i mean which color which particular colors it was because i don't recall <laughs> but it, it is it is a nice one. It, the way um actually speaking of abstract painting one of the things that i've noticed having to work in the gallery is i think the way you use the color in mm. the glass um there's sort of a color theory thing that happens too, like like the Joseph Albers where you put two colors next to each I other. I do sometimes, they have, yeah. They like resonate. Yep. Um, I I try that. I, I mean, the the materials that we have, like very few people make their own colored glass. It's a, a, there's a lot of chemistry and it's sort of nasty business. So we all have the same tubes of paint, if you will, the com the commercially available uh, colored glass, and uh, you. Occasionally, we mix. I'll mix it up and, and try things that I think are going to be successful in terms of, of uh, you know, creating what you just said with the, the metallic quality that that has. But a lot of them, like that yellow, are just good straight out of the tube. Yeah, you know, it, this, it's that's, this yellow piece is one of my favorite yeah, in the show. Sure. Yeah, I really, I really, um, I was talking to my buddy John Kylie today, and uh, he mentioned he referenced something that. Um, he had recently given away a piece that was yellow. And he said it was like me and him and that guy were the only three people that liked it because nobody likes yellow. And I, was, I didn't say anything to him at the time, but I did pretty good with yellow. Yeah. Yeah. Years. <laughs> and they make, there's some good ones. Yellows and reds are difficult colors to make. In, and I'm no chemist, I'm not an expert on this stuff at all, but, and it's also nasty business. There's dangerous uh, chemicals that go into the, the like, uh, cadmium and selenium or not selenium but cobalt uh cobalt's not inherently dangerous but chrome in the green is and it's just it's icky business so uh when the, but they make really good ye yellow colors hmm. I, I think i've always been really partial to yellow things so I love seeing all these pieces in the gallery together and seeing how active they are. I mean, for being sort of a static standing vessel, yeah. like as you just move through the space, they're constantly shifting and it's that's, really active. That's the there. idea, yeah. yeah. You know, I like, I like them individually beautifully, but I also like them when they're adjacent to each other or interacting with each other as well. Yeah. I think that, a combination of two or three or four of them working together makes a great installation. Sounds good to me. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's just not a sales pitch. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> that that orange. I call that orange the one on the right. Mm -hmm. Or did we call it red? I can't remember. We called it red. But... We did. Well, compared to that one, it's pretty orange. That's that's a handsome color too. I like seeing this stuff in this environment because my studio does not. Provide a very clean or minimalist uh, way of displaying things. There's so much stuff in my studio, glass objects and motorbikes and things like that. And uh, this is nice to see them where you can just focus on the things, the objects. So Dante, I know you don't get to be in the glass blowing studio for a little bit. Okay. Right. But are you going to continue working on this series when you? Yeah, I was actually really looking forward to getting back to work uh, this month after having all summer off. But I had a, I had, you know, I started wearing this thing, and uh, I will wear it, or I'll be out of the stu glass studio through the end of the year. So 
I'm going to do patterns. The guys are going to make the rondelles and mm -hmm. I, can, I can do that part. I can work again, yeah. but it remains to be seen what it'll be like to do stuff after my, after this. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that does bear mentioning. Plus I'm walking around with this thing on. So this show will be up for a month. Yep. Up through the month of October. So um, hopefully folks are, if you're in town or coming to town for any of the refract or Kolchak festivities, come by. Um, come by for sure. I know on Saturday the 16th, in the middle of the day, we're doing an in-person walkthrough with you. At my studio or here? No, here, here? in the gallery. Okay. okay. And then on the 15th in the afternoon, we're doing another virtual uh, at three o'clock in the afternoon, thanks, Dan. <laughs> um, we're doing a Zoom studio visit. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. So, right. if folks are interested in joining for any of those, um, you can find that information in emails that we send out or just call us and ask, and we'll and send the, you the info. The studio visit would be, a, I'll have visual aids and I can show yeah. people how. Yeah, it actually would stuff. be kind of a nice follow up yeah, to doing right. this Zoom tour. Because right. like I, have, I have all the, all the stuff there. I can explain it better. And so during this COVID uh, period, the gallery is open. We have our regular hours. You can find that on our website. And you can also visit the gallery and just by calling up and when you're at our front door, we'll let you in. So it, that's a possibility too, so. Absolutely. Um, I think we have a couple more minutes. I just wanted to acknowledge that this show is paired with the Junjaneko show. Absolutely. And, um, would love your thoughts on that. I mean, I, I have my own thoughts about why that's an amazing pairing. But well, I don't. I had nothing to do with that. That was up to you guys. <laughs> but I was. I'm pretty. I'm pretty honored to be, you know, working or having the show with him because I've always been a really big fan of uh, his work. And when I look at it, uh, I I see that he he's he seems like more of a painter than anything else to mm -hmm. me. Like the forms although are intriguing and strangely compelling at the same time are about the surface and and then he has objects on the wall and, and whatnot and and uh i really like the painterly quality of it yeah it's really, it's really cool i'm sorry he couldn't he couldn't be here tonight yeah he, he uh as i meant, as i recall he was at risd at the same time dale truly was at risd probably and they were teaching together yeah. contemporaries yeah of each other and know each other so of that same era yeah my era <laughs> right yeah yeah i'm a big fan so i'm happy mm -hmm. i'm happy yeah. to uh well i'm glad you made that connection because that was sort of our thought as well is that like, right here are two people who are working in sort of traditional craft media and yeah. often get kind of like relegated to these corners of glass and ceramic and both of you approach the work um with really kind of a painter's approach you know this yeah. like wanting there to using that as a canvas and creating these sort of abstractions and yeah it's kind of a newer thing for me than it is for him he's been doing it all along with all that why don't we walk up here and we can just pass by one of these Kaneko pieces <clears throat> the other thing that i noticed about june's work seeing it here with your work is how glassy the ceramic surfaces yep. are you know, really those high fire pieces in particular where the glazes kind of become light. I mean, they are glass. Yeah, it, it is. It is. And, and um... <laughs> I see, you can see some similarities here. <laughs> sort of. A lot of cobalt happening <laughs> in, that, in that frame. Even the shape a bit, you know, there's some of the aspects of it. But it, the show pairs beautifully together. Thank you. I'm, that's great. I like it. Very cool. 